And I, once again, I would like to welcome everyone to our uh, webinar, Los Angeles Birders webinar for tonight. We have Chris McCready with us, and we are very excited about the presentation. Looking forward to it. Uh, Kimball Garrett is also presenting with us. And about Los Angeles Birders briefly, uh, we are an all volunteer organization. Uh, our entire director, staff, officers all serve uh, as volunteers. And um, we rely upon your membership and donations to help us with these uh, recorded webinars. And we put them on our website for in perpetuity. Does that mean for a long time? Yes. I think it, I think it does. Okay. <laughs> we have a numerous community science projects we have to our students that we like to mentor and bring along. And um, we have other financial needs. So we appreciate your membership, your support, and your contributions. Next. And with that, who am I introducing, uh, Susan, to introduce Chris? And Kimball. Kim Kimball will be introducing Chris. Oh, OK. Kimball, uh, uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Kimball Garrett, a former member of Los Angeles Birders Board and uh, a co-presenter, I guess. Kimball? Why, thank you. And I apologize for totally having forgotten that I was introducing Chris. So I'm merely going to say that Chris McCready is a person who needs no introduction. <laughs> um, and he deserves much more than that, but we know him for many things, his work with the Point Blue and surveys uh, throughout much of the Southwest. And he's really dived deeply into the issues of the Artemisia species of sparrows, uh, which is what brings him here tonight to talk to us. And uh, we really appreciate that. In fact, his magnum opus was recently published in the Journal of Field Ornithology. And I assume you'll be talking about quite a bit of what's in that paper. And I'm I'm hoping a link to that paper will be put into the chat or, or available somehow. So I really yes. um, encourage it. But I am, I, I totally admit to having forgotten that I was introducing Chris. So I'm going to let him give whatever portion of his bio he feels is important to give as he starts talking. He could do a much better job than I can anyway. And I might also mention that I'm going to be a very brief warm-up act before Chris actually begins to give his talk. So we really welcome Chris to LA Birders, and we much appreciate his sharing his immense knowledge of um, sagebrush and bell sparrows. Thank you, Kimball. Are you going to talk a bit about uh, your findings in Los Angeles, or do you want me to start? No, I think I'll go ahead and do that first. So I will share my screen. It's just going to be a couple minutes because um, I'm just a brief opening act and you're the main attraction. So let's, uh, let's get while started Kimball, with that. While Kimball is bringing that up, Ted Kyle uh, uh, shared on chat the article that Kimball referred to. And uh, you can grab it off the chat and we will also put it on our website. I'm sorry, go ahead, Kimball. Oh, okay, is my screen showing for everybody? Yes, it is. Is that a yes? That's yes, a yes, yes, good. it is. Okay, I just briefly wanted to say that many of you who've been following LA Birders know that one of the first sort of field projects we did was to just try and figure out what's going on with sagebrush sparrows in Los Angeles County. Um, we know they must be here, but there are very few uh, in fact, virtually no well-documented records um, other than a couple of specimens, including one from San Clemente Island, um, as a highly migratory species, we know they must get here. So we started the great sagebrush sparrow hunt in the winter of 2020, 2021, and had people combing the deserts. And we got an awful lot of birds that looked like they were probably sagebrush sparrows, but we weren't sure we really began to appreciate the variation shown by bell sparrows. And um, recently, and again, with Chris's tremendous help, we've uh, zeroed in on a number of well-documented sagebrush sparrows that we've finally validated and confirmed 
in eBird. So I just wanted to give a brief summary of that and then um, we'll take it from there. So you all saw Andy Birch's artwork. In fact, the artwork he did on the Sage Sparrow group ended up um, producing the logo for LA Birders, which is very nice, but the sagebrush sparrows and then the two subspecies of bell sparrows that occur in the county, um, not counting the additional one on San Clemente Island, Canessens, um, which is a common breeding bird in the Antelope Valley, and then the bell sparrow, which is the darker bird of more sort of coastal slope chaparral. Uh, remember from the LA Breeding Bird Atlas on the left here, the birds in the mountains and toward the coast are the darker nominate bells and all those birds out in the Antelope Valley are canessens or the Mojave Bell Sparrow. Sagebrush Sparrow is merely a migrant winter visitor. So if you back out and look at the map on the right, you can see the broader breeding ranges of the coastal Bell Sparrow, which is also in the Sierra foothills locally. And then the Mojave Desert canessens, which also gets up into the um, Western San Joaquin Valley. And finally, just a bit of the range of sagebrush sparrows in the kind of Great Basin area of Mono County, north through the northeastern corner of California, and then widely out into the Great Basin from there. So that's sort of the background of who's where. Uh, we came up with some protocols for doing the, um, uh, the surveys there. Well, I don't even need to go through all this, but we had a lot of really good participation, which we really appreciate. Um, in terms of habitats, now Chris is going to go into this quite a bit, but much of the Antelope Valley and the more natural habitats, at least, are um, either dominated by creosote scrub uh, on the right, which is these evenly spaced shrubs, which can be more dense or less dense and taller or shorter, depending on where you are and the slope and the soil. And then a lot of the lower areas have various kinds of have salt bush and other halophytic vegetation. So those are the two main things. Um, in some areas, it's more wooded with Joshua trees, and of course, a lot of disturbed areas. And the major new habitat in the Antelope Valley is solar panels. It's probably going to be the most common habitat, but probably not too good for sparrows. So just to show you a handful of the ones we have confirmed in eBird, and again, Chris has, has vetted these. So this is a bird um, seemed to like to crash. Uh, there are actually several sagebrush sparrows were documented at this site, which was an area with a leaky water faucet out at Avenue J and 240th Street East. And um, several different observers photographed sage sparrows here. Here's just a couple I had on the 1st of December. And the, some of the key features, which again, I'm sure Chris will be going through, are the even dark, sharp black streaking all the way across the back. Um, now we know the bells have streaking there. It can even sometimes appear to go across the back, but when you've got long black sharp streaks all the way across, that's a sagebrush character. The mailer or whisker mark is very thin, kind of clouded with white, so it's not jet black and doesn't normally reach the bill. So here's one of the examples. Here's another one from the same spot that Chris Dean photographed. Again, you see that weak mailer that pretty much peters out before it re reaches the bill and the even striping across the back. Now we have a lot of candidates for a sagebrush sparrow, but the photos just don't quite show enough of the back to be sure. And there's some other more subtle characters, many of which are really only useful in the hand. Here's another bird, maybe not quite as obviously marked, but this was out in the West Antelope Valley. Um, Avenue B around 70th Street West. And this is, um, uh, Will Tyre photographed this bird, but again, sharp black streakings across the back. They do have a slightly longer primary extension beyond the tertials, but this is probably not useful as a field mark in most cases. Uh, they're a little bit paler overall, and in most measurements are a little larger than bell sparrows. Here's another nicely marked bird that Mark Shield photographed um, this again in the Eastern Antelope Valley. So you see that distinctive back pattern and the very thin mailer clouded with white that doesn't reach the beak. Uh, you can see actually here, one, two, three, four, five, six primaries beyond the tertials. And this 
might be a useful mark, but it's extremely difficult to assess in the field. Um, and here's yet another one. I think Frank was out there with Susan. I think uh, Desi, uh, many others were there that day. This is very close to Saddleback Butte. And here's a nicely, again, a nicely marked bird. And this was one of the few sagebrush sparrow encounters that was also nicely documented with recordings of a diagnostic song. You can see what the habitat was like there, which was creosote with scattered Joshua trees. So this is where we have confirmed sagebrush sparrows for LA County. And you can see they really span the length of the Antelope Valley. If you go far to the west, this is actually barely into Kern County. Uh, was not part of the great sagebrush sparrow hunt, but this is quite a number of birds that Richard Crossley and Daniel Irons had in the uh, early part of 2023. And you see the one I showed you from uh, West Avenue B, and then several around sage around Saddleback Butte and a few farther east. This is at 240th, 240th and Avenue J. And you can see these are sort of continuous with sightings further east into San Bernardino County. So um, it's clear sagebrush sparrows are out there, uh, but arm yourselves with a good camera, try and get recordings if they're singing. One thing we certainly found was that um, bell sparrows and sagebrush sparrows will both um, sing in response to tapes of either species. But you can't just say, well, I played a sagebrush sparrow tape and it sang so it was a sagebrush sparrow it's not quite that simple but again here's i think we can pretty much assume that they are widespread through the natural creosote and saltbush habitats in the antelope valley and um i think perhaps they might slightly be more attracted to creosote on slopes and bases of buttes and things like that than in real flat saltbush but we don't know enough yet so we'll we'll see so that's just a very brief sort of summary of what um, we found. There's many of you have submitted other records, uh, often with photos of sparrows that were probably sagebrush sparrows, and we're going to go through these in more detail. So, um, but for now, really good photos seem to be necessary for us to be satisfied. That's what they are. So, thanks for all your help with that survey. You can go repeat that anytime you want at least until about February or March before they leave. And uh, we'll keep learning more incrementally. So thanks. And uh, Chris, I'm going to send it over to you. OK, Chris, you are on mute. Can you, show, can you see my screen? Yes. OK, let me start from the beginning here. Okay. Um, and you probably need presentation mode. My cursor went away. Let's see. Okay, let me stop my share for a sec. Okay, let's try this again. How's that? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, it's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, my name is is Chris McCready, and I I um here to talk about sagebrush sparrows and bell sparrows. Um, I want to thank my co-authors, uh, Michael Lester and Adrian Kovac. Um, we did all this work with about a. $2,000 grant, I think it was, from Arizona Field Ornithologists. So Michael uh, was out with me um, working on uh, catching birds and on vegetation. And Dr. Kovac uh, analyzed her blood samples pro bono uh, with her classes. And so we couldn't have done this without them. And um, when, when Dr. Kovac says she would analyze her samples, it's one of the nicest things anybody's ever done for me. So I want to thank her. Um, and then I wanted to thank all of um, my volunteers really quickly. So Michael's wife, Autumn, assisted him with vegetation sampling. Uh, Jennifer Walsh played a big role in helping Dr. Kovac. Uh, some of you might know Larry Norris from Arizona. He lent us uh, several nets and poles. Um, 
my professor at the University of Arizona, Dr. Van Riper, uh, helped us with blood sampling training. And then a number of people, um, we surveyed sites all over Western Arizona and several of these people traveled with us the entire time all over the state um, for free. And um, it, the entire protocol required lots of people to do this. And so again, I wanted to thank them before I started. And then, uh, yeah, somebody put it in the chat, but we, we wrote an article up on this and it was published in the Journal of Field Ornithology um, and the link is there and it's in the chat as well. Um, I also kind of want to apologize in advance. Um, my wife is due in like two weeks and so it's been very busy and I haven't had time to practice my talk and so I'll do my best, but it's a little choppy, that's why. Um, so I worked for a long time with Point Blue Conservation Science. It used to be called Point Race Bird Observatory, PRBO. I was thinking of it as PRBO. And this is these are some of my sample or study sites across the Southwest, the yellow dots. Um, I've worked on things like willow flycatchers and uh, dusky flycatchers. There was a St. Patrick population at Mona Lake that I had all color banded for many years uh, before the willow flycatchers uh, blinked out in 2013. Um, we've been working on uh, an all species riparian study at the Amargosa River since 2005 um, that studies the effects of restoration and covered management on the songbird community there uh, with lots of bells videos there. Um, I was Point Blue's lead desert person for a number of years. And so I had a lot of sites all over the desert. Um, and I work a lot now with the Desert Thrasher Working Group, uh, which is a group of researchers from California and Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, and Mexico, and Utah. And we're all working to help prevent Ben Dyer's Thrashers and Lacan's Thrashers from further decline and being listed one day. Um, so I do that. And then recently, I've been involved with a lot of uh, work on the Inyo California toei. Uh, it's a listed subspecies of California toei that's endemic to um, the Argus Range, uh, just north of Ridgecrest. And so I, I think I'm going to be out there this year doing surveys as well. Um, so, and then there's the Sage Sparrow Project. So, um, oh, and I, I, I currently work with the American Bird Conservancy. Uh, my job here is the Southwest Riparian Bird Recovery Coordinator. It's a long name. Um, I work a lot with Lee Spells Vireo uh, Recovery in Southern California. I'm kind of a liaison between the Department of Defense and the BLM and the Fish and Wildlife Service and USGS and California Department of Fish and Wildlife and lots and lots of other people that are all working to try to get least those videos over the hump and get them recovered. Um, and so I live here in San Diego with my wife doing that now. Um, and I should say that it's not just those videos. I work on all riparian species, but that's those videos take up a lot of my time currently. Um, okay. So bells and sagebrush sparrows. Um, this is a bells um, in a hand. Um, and this is a sagebrush. And I'll talk about the differences between them later on in the talk. Um, some background on the species. So this is an eBird map showing bell sparrow uh, abundance. The purple is year round where you can find them all year round. Um, the red is dur during the breeding season only and blue is during the non-breeding season. And so these eBird maps are great. They're also sort of just beginning, I think. Sometimes the desert is not all that well birded. And so I, 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 I treat eBird maps of the desert, the, the modeled maps like these, with a grain of salt because it's, you know, it's based on maybe not enough data yet. Uh, but you can see here uh, the, let's see, whoops. Let me go back here. My mouse is working against me here. So, okay, so um, I was not showing my cursor. There it is. Okay, so the the probably here in the middle. This is uh, the the sort of Western Mojave, oh, yeah, um, that Kimball was just recently talking about. And so bell sparrows are found here year round. They breed here in fairly high numbers. Um, the population continues northward into uh, the North Mojave. Um, my cursor is not doing well, so I'll just kind of pretend I don't have it. Um, and then further to the west, on the west side of the Central Valley uh, near the Carrizo Plain, you can find uh, Canessens bell sparrows as well. 
Um, the nominate bells is along the coast. Um, yeah, I can't show you my cursor. Um, and then they migrate in the fall to the southeast towards the Sonoran Desert. And you can see that in the blue here. Um, as far as Arizona, there are a couple of records as far east as Tucson, uh, and they also move south into uh, Mexico, um, north of the Gulf of the California. Um, this is the non-breeding map of Bell Sparrow. So you can see that if you focus on that purple area in the Mojave Desert, and then move to the non-breeding, quite a few of them uh, stick uh, all year round um, on the breeding grounds. Not all of them seem to migrate. Um, and so I'll talk about that later as well. Um, and then here's sagebrush sparrow. And um, again, red is breeding season only, blue is non-breeding season only, and purple is year round. Um, yeah, my cursor is, oh, there it is. Um, so the southern end of the sagebrush sparrow breeding distribution is um, just at the northern end of the Owens Valley um, near Bishop. There's a contact zone uh, around Bishop, and that's where sagebrush sparrows just north of there began to uh, to breed. As you, If you're familiar with Bishop, as you head north out of town on 395, you go up what's called the Sherwin Grade, and suddenly you're at 7,000 feet, and you see Crowley Lake, and that's where you can find sagebrush sparrows nesting. We're down in Bishop, uh, it's contact zone, and really thought to be probably more or less bells down there. Um, so the, I'll start with um, a summary of some of the work that's been done. There's, it's, it's a kind of an interesting, good story on how the species were separated and the work that went into it. There are a series of really good papers that talk about um, the taxonomy of these two species. They used to be uh, referred to as sage sparrows and the genus was Amphispiza. Um, and they were thought to be in the same genus as black-throated sparrows here. Um, Clicka and Spellman, um, I think, I can't see because of the zoom, I think it's 2007, found that um, the genus was not monophyletic and that um, sage sparrows were actually more closely related to the grassland sparrow clade. Uh, Poecides and Amadramus, uh, it's now named as Amospiza. And several others, and they so they separated them out from black-throated sparrow. And in 2011, Clicka and Banks formally named the genus Artemisiospiza. Um, meanwhile, before that, back in the 90s, Ned Johnson and Jill Martin uh, showed that um, nominate bell sparrow, the one that's found um, in the, sort of the coastal chaparral, um, Belli and Knesset the desert Mojave, the Mojave bell sparrow, they, they found that they were more closely related to each other and that they were separate from what we now think of as sagebrush sparrow, uh, the subspecies Nevidensis. Um, in a pretty good paper, Patton and Unit challenged them. Um, they thought, they, 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 they analyzed specimens and they found that they didn't think that Canescence, the Mojave bell sparrow, and Nevidensis, what's now sagebrush sparrow, they didn't think they were diagnosable. They found that they were too similar to be separated uh, with overlapping traits. They felt that only nominate bellii and uh, a subspecies uh, in Mexico, in, in, in Baja, uh, Cinerea, and then Nevidensis, those should be the three subspecies. Um, they, in turn, were rebutted sort of back by... Um, Carla Cicero and Ned Johnson in a really nice paper. And they showed that um, Patton and Unit had, um, they had mixed breeding and non-breeding specimens in their samples. And so Patton and Unit had tried to show that, you know, if these are bell sparrows and these are sagebrush sparrows, um, we find too much overlap. And what Cicero and Johnson showed was that it seemed that Patton and Unit perhaps um, included um, non-breeding birds in their samples um, sagebrush sparrows migrate through the bell sparrow range, so it's possible that they'd included um, sagebrush sparrows as bell sparrows in their comparisons. And so they, they found that when you use a very narrow window for these birds breed here, sagebrush sparrows breed here, they all those measurements did separate out. Um, further, uh, Sister and Johnson used mitochondrial DNA to show, to sort of um, provide further evidence that uh, Nevidensis and Canescens really were different um, taxa. 
Um, in 2007, they identified a, a narrow contact zone, uh, as I mentioned, around Bishop, uh, between the breeding ranges of Canessens and Evidensis. And, and then in 2012, Cicero and Ku uh, wrote a nice paper that analyzed mitochondrial DNA and morphological differences. And they use ecological niche models to support a proposal for a full species status for sagebrush sparrow. And so this figure is a map from their study. Let's see if my cursor works. Yeah, there it is. So all of these uh, pie charts are, are focused on the Owens Valley around Bishop. Um, orange is Nevidensis. Yellow is Canescence Bell Sparrow. Blue is Nominate Bellii. And they demonstrated that, you know, here's the contact zone. It's a very small area where you can find birds uh, that... Um, share haplotypes between the species or between the taxa. Um, and sagebrush sparrow again was, um, I guess you'd say voted as a, as a full species in the checklist of North America birds in 2013. Um, after that, Peter Pyle produced a really nice uh, guide on um, the differences between sagebrush sparrow and uh, Canessens bell sparrow, looking at specimens, I think at the Berkeley uh, Museum of uh, Vertebrate Zoology, if I remember right. Um, and I have the link here, and I have it later on the talk. I, I highly encourage you to uh, go over Peter's work. Um, he does a really good job of showing the differences in the back streaks that Kimball mentioned, um, showing differences in the mailer streaks, and really explaining what happens to these characteristics as the feathers wear. So the birds molt in the fall and the feathers are fresh. Uh, the streaks in the back are darker in the fall. Um, even on bells, there are some streaks and they're a little bit darker in the fall. As those feathers wear and as the sun bleaches them out, those, those streaks fade. And Peter has some nice figures that show you how that fade works. And so you have to take that into account when you're trying to identify these things. When did you observe them? When is your photograph taken? That, that can really matter. Um, as you try to sort out the birds you see in the field. Um, the other thing, so we had Peter's guide when we started our project, and we had a really nice um, set of uh, whisker plots um, from Cicero and Johnson that showed on the top here that these are male wing cords. Uh, the gray uh, distributions are... Um, Nevidensis from about 13 sites that they worked on, and then the hatched um, box plots here. Oh, my cursor just gone. There it is. Uh, these are canescents. Uh, so you can see how canescents have shorter wings uh, than sagebrush sparrow males. And then the bottom two, uh, these compare uh, the wing cords for male uh, and female. Um, Nevidensis and Canessens, again, showing you that there's um, not very much overlap between the wing cords of the two species. Um, so we got the grant from Arizona Field Ornithologists, and the objective was to survey as much of Arizona as we could um, with a couple thousand dollars um, and to cover as wide of a variety of vegetation types as we could. So these yellow dots here are our sites. Um, this is called Robins Butte. It's just southwest of Phoenix on the Gila River. Um, this site here is called Tacna. It's in Yuma County. Um, and I'll talk about the habitat of these sites more. Uh, this site here is the Kofa Mountains Bajada, also in Yuma County. It's just west of the Kofa National Wildlife Refuge. Um, the site here on the left, on the west, this is Fort Mojave. Uh, it's really close to Bullhead City, and it's on the edge of the Colorado River's floodplain. And then to the east is Boundary Cone. That's up in elevation. It's on another Bajada uh, near um, uh, a small mountain that's kind of beautiful called Boundary Cone. So our survey period was February 6th to the 16th in 2014. Um, and we, um, we used, we, I had a little bit of intel, not much, uh, about where I might find sage sparrows. Uh, Troy Corman told me about Robin's Butte. Uh, some of you might know Henry Duttweiler. He's from Yuma. He had a site uh, where he shows people the conch thrashers uh, at Tacna. Um, I knew about the uh, the Kofa Bahada, Kofa Mountains Bahada, because I had done my thesis near there. 
Um, and David Vanderplein and Lauren Harder uh, suggested um, boundary cone to me. And then uh, there was a recent eBird report from Donald Sutherland on the Fort Mojave site. Um, at this point in time, the species hadn't been separated very long. Um, there was a lot of angst about whether or not they could be told apart. Uh, no one really knew for sure how to do it. Peter had drafted his guide. Um, we had no idea what we'd find. It was really exciting. We, we had no idea about habitat differences or birds segregating or anything. We just knew that there might be sage, sage sparrows at these places. Um, and we didn't know, Michael and I didn't know we'd be able to tell them apart. Um, and so again, we just, we crossed our fingers and hoped it would work. Um, in the field, uh, we took a number of uh, measurements on the birds. Um, and I don't want to go too deep into that, but it's in the slide if uh, you want to look at that later. Um, this map here shows you Robin's Butte. Uh, it's on the southern end of the Gila River floodplain. It's, uh, so these yellow dots are vegetation uh, plots, and this yellow polygon is where we were, were flushing sparrows into nets. So we used a method um, that was taught to me by Janet Ruth, who was working on grasshopper sparrows and Baird sparrows uh, south of southeast of Tucson. She in turn got it from Caleb Gordon. And it's basically you set up four to six nets in a wall and you get anywhere between 10 and 20 people and you make a big sort of C. Uh, Michael was on one end of the C and I was on the other end. We had walkie talkies and you slowly but surely direct people uh, herding birds towards the nets. Um, you don't know what you're going to catch. You catch all kinds of other things. So it's really kind of fun. Um, and that was the, you know, we didn't know if that would work for sparrows. I'd seen it work for grasshopper sparrows. So I had a hunch that it might work for this, but we didn't really know. Um, we took a number of morphometric measurements. Um, we hoped that we would discover new ways to tell them apart. What we didn't realize is that when you herd a bunch of birds into the net, somebody's got to get them out of the nets and measure them and photograph them. So we were we never had enough people around that knew how to bend birds uh, to give us as much time as we wanted with the birds. So we took our measurements. We did not have time to um, you know, hold the bird for a long time and really figure out new ways to look at them. But we took photographs of everything. Um, I would take photographs of the head and the nape and the back and the wings and the front. Uh, the streaks on the flanks, the tail, um, systematically for every bird that we captured. And then uh, Adrian Kovacs' lab worked on uh, the mitochondrial DNA analysis for us. We, she, I think, basically mirrored what uh, Carla Cicero and uh, Ned Johnson and uh, uh, I forget her first name, what uh, Ku worked on um, with their papers. And so she did she used the same approach to analyze our blood. Um. And then for vegetation, this photograph here, this is from Robin's Butte. Um, we put down a pretty simple protocol that I'd used in Nevada working with Erica Fleischman, um, where you have random transects and you're looking at species composition and perennial shrubs or shrubs and trees and then how much bare ground is around. So again, we didn't have much funding. It had to be really easy, um, but it was effective at showing differences between the habitat types. Um, we caught 86 birds. Uh, 86 uh, sage sparrows. When I say sage sparrow, I'm referring to both bells and sagebrush. Um, we got blood samples from 74. We actually got blood samples from 75. To this day, I've always regretted it because on the 75th bird, we didn't know what... You, we figured out over the first day, we realized that it was pretty easy to tell them apart in the hand. Uh, after a few birds, we were lucky in that at Robin's View, we happened to catch both species. So we saw them both. And we realized, oh, we can do this. This isn't all that hard to tell them apart in the hand. In the field, this is another matter. But if you're holding the bird and you have time with it, you begin to see the differences in the plumages. And it helped a lot having uh, Carla and Ned's uh, wing cord measurements to help us check ourselves. Um, but there was a bird, the 75th bird, that we really weren't sure. And so when we sent in the blood samples, we used SABS, SABS, uh, the code for sagebrush sparrow, and uh, BESP, bell sparrow, for that code for bell sparrows. And then for the intermediate bird, we used the old code, SAGS, SAGS. That was the old code for sage sparrow. 
And Adrian's lab didn't know what SAGs meant. And so they didn't analyze that, that sample. Um, so I, I've always wondered what that one bird was and I couldn't find out. Um, we found that our genetic results were consistent with 92% of our field identifications in the hand. So 68 of 74. Um, but the thing is, is that um, we were using mitochondrial DNA analysis. This is effective. Um, it's not, it's, it's inexpensive. It's, you can look at the whole genome and separate birds uh, with much more precision than that method. Um, I was lucky in that Van Remsen uh, reviewed my manuscript and he explained to me that, you know, as far as if you're thinking about mitochondrial DNA, there are humans that have Neanderthal uh, mitochondrial DNA. It doesn't make them hybrids. It just, they ha it floats around. So, and, and Carla Cicero points this out in their papers, a small number of her birds it looks like a bell sparrow. It's the same size as a bell sparrow, but it has uh, the sagebrush haplotype. Um, an even smaller number of birds um, look like sagebrush sparrows. They're big like sagebrush sparrows, but they have um, the bell sparrow haplotype. So, you know, I always, I, I want to get them all right. And, and But using this method uh, of genetic analysis, you, you, you kind of can't uh, know for sure for all of them. Um. We found that in general, and Kibble mentioned this, that sage sparrows are bigger. They have longer wings. Um, they have longer tails. They weigh a little bit heavier. Um, they have longer and deeper bills. Um, they have a longer primary projection. And then on a sagebrush sparrow, there's a bigger gap of white uh, between the top of the malar streak and the bottom of the bill. Um, and so this is in the paper. It, it, we found that all of these differences were significant uh, at a, a, a probability of less than 0.5 or 0 0.05, except for weight. And for that one, P equaled uh, 0.06. So it was nearly significant. Um, so again, sagebrush sparrows are a little bigger, they're a little rangier um, than bell sparrows. Um, for our captures, I, the next series of slides will show you the capture totals and the habitat. So again, here's Robin's Butte. All of this light green stuff uh, in the foreground, this is um, Atroplex polycarpa. Uh, I think it's the common name might be um, all scale, but I'm not sure. I sometimes get them mixed up. Uh, but Atroplex, Atroplex polycarpa is, is the scientific name. You can see mesquites here in the back. Again, we were on the edge of the Gila River floodplain. So looking north here, you can see uh, the mesquites get thicker and thicker until it turns into tamarisk, and you're on the Gila itself. Uh, at this site, we caught mostly bell sparrows, uh, 27 bells, and just six sagebrush sparrows. Um, and again, we had no idea what we'd get at these sites. We didn't realize that this would be the only site where we caught both species. Um, if you notice here also, um, we caught many, many more female bell sparrows than males. We had 23 female bells and only four male bells. Um, so a, a, a fairly skewed um, proportion uh, towards female for the bells captures. Um, this next site, this is Tacna, again in Yuma County. Um, here we only caught sagebrush sparrows. They were in low densities. There were more out there. Uh, we only happened to catch two that day. It wasn't easy. There wasn't much cover for the nets, I think. Um, and people have been birding this site over the years. It's again, it's a good spot to find the conch thrashers, and uh, only bell or only sagebrush sparrows have been found here. You can see how open it is. Uh, these shrubs. This is four wing saltbush, uh, Atroplex canescens. Um, I think there are a few young creosotes, and and you can kind of see there are some berms that move across the the frame here. This used to be, I think, an old uh, citrus orchard that um, was went fallow uh, several decades ago. By the time we got there, it had been fallow for a long time, but it hasn't come back yet. Um, this site is pretty sandy. If you look at this site in Google Earth, you can see that this is on the end of a long sandy mesa that extends from the south. Uh, and uh, looking again to the north, this is again the Gila Valley uh, beyond the berm as far as you can see there where it's shaded. Um, this next site, this is the Kofa Mountains Bahada. Um, you can see here, this is creosote. There's some pencil choya. Um, 
there's white burst sage, the, the light green small shrubs here. You can see these small wash channels. Um, there's saguaro here. Uh, they're, they don't show in the photograph, but there were a few ironwoods here. Um, again, here we only caught sagebrush sparrows. Um, and again, they were in low densities, although we had a few more this time. Um, this site, this is Fort Mojave. So this is again on the edge of the Colorado River floodplain. Um, it's near uh, an, an operating golf course that's just to the left off the screen here. Um, so all of this dark vegetation, this is a plant called, it has different common names. Uh, some people call it inkbush uh, or Mojave sea blight. Uh, the scientific name is Sueda nigra, or I often just call it Sueda. And you find this in halophytic sort of like loose, uh, like not loose, but, but clay, uh, really fine grain, clay, silty soils on, uh, where you might expect water to perhaps even pool during big rains. Um, it's also not in the photograph, there was quite a bit of what's called quail bush here, uh, Atropolex lentiformis. Um, and so this is a kind of a, a common, um, I don't know if it, it's not exactly a riparian, it's kind of like facultative riparian habitat that you'll see around Baker in the Mojave Desert or along the Amargosa River or along the Colorado River, uh, places where you have more halophytic soil that has more salt content in it. Um, and at this site, um, we caught only bell sparrows. Uh, we had 29 bells, no sagebrushes. Um, and again, here also, they're almost all females, 25 females and only four males. We were here for two days, and after we caught like something like 24 or 25 bells in a row, uh, I was, you know, I was with all the people. I was like, you guys, we have to, we need some sagebrush sparrows for the sample. This is kind of, we're just going to catch bells forever here. I don't, let's, you know, let's go to some more Bahada habitat where we might get sagebrush. And, and that's when David and Lauren knew the site up the slope at Boundary Cone uh, here. Um, and sure enough, we went out there and, and, and we caught only sagebrush sparrows there and again, the low densities. So here you have creosote, it's pretty rocky. Um, there's, there, it, the, there's brittle bush and celia farinosa in the foreground here. Uh, there's dead or dying fish hook cactus, these dark blobs here. Uh, there's quite a bit of, it used to be a uh, hymenoclea salsola, I think now it's ambrosia salsola or a burrow brush. Um, this is kind of a really broad, it's almost like a huge wash that comes out of the mountains here. And we only caught sagebrush sparrows here. So again, um, for bell sparrows, we I, I, I can't see the percentage because either I forgot to put it in there or the Zoom thing's blocking it, but 48 out of 56 of our bell sparrows were females. Um, the likelihood of of of, of Getting that ratio uh, is very low. P is less than 0.0001. It's highly significant. If you were to assume that you expected to catch, you know, 50% females, 50% males, then you would have expected a, pro a proportion between uh, 37 and 63%. And I think ours was like in the 80s. Um, at the two sites, uh, Robins Butte, I can't see it because of the Zoom thing. Uh, but it's, I think it was 20, I shouldn't guess, uh, but it was well over 80% females at Robbins Butte and then 25 out of 29 females at Fort Mojave. Um, and so what this kind of tells me is that, you know, we're catching all these females. If you go back up to that distribution map, let's see if I can get there really fast here. Doesn't go as fast as I hope, but we'll get there. Yeah. Okay. So we were catching birds on the very edge of the of the winter distribution down here. For or Robins Butte's here. Uh, for Mojave's here. It suggested to me that um, maybe we might be seeing something called differential migration. It's been found in other species where the, the, 
the males migrate a shorter distance. Some might even stay on, on the breeding grounds all season. And the females dis disproportionately migrate farther away from the breeding grounds. And so given the, our, our capture ratios and all those females, given the fact that I'm very much aware that bell sparrows are, are, are in significant numbers all year round on the breeding grounds and that you can, you know, you can go up to, to Bishop at this time of the year in the middle of January and find lots of bell sparrows even singing. Um, I suspect and my, if I had more time and, and lots of funding, I would go up there and run the same study up in the breeding grounds and see if we can find uh, a male bias proportion on the breeding ground. That's what I expect people will find. And I hope that somebody does, does that before I get a chance to. Um, the other thing was that I found online, there's a really nice website called vertnet.org where you can go online and check out uh, museum skin specimens, specimens for all kinds of different bird species. And so participating museums, uh, in this case, the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology at Berkeley, San Diego Natural History Museum, and the University of Michigan Museum of Zoology have their, their specimens online. You can look them up and they're sexed. And so looking at sites um, outside of the Bell Sparrow breeding distribution uh, at all of the records online, uh, again, I found that 80% um, you know, of those museum specimens uh, that were collected in the winter outside of the breeding distribution were females. And it's sort of, it's consistent with what we found in the field as well. Um, again, suggesting that differential migration is happening for bell sparrows. This map is an eBird map of bell sparrow records. This just, it, you can turn it on so it only shows you photographs and video. And for me, it's much preferred because these things are hard to par tell apart in the field and I don't always trust eBird reports that don't have documentation. And you can see, um, you know, this pattern of, of lots of bell sparrows in the Western Mojave. And then where the birds come east, um, you're only finding photographed birds on the Colorado, around the salt and sick sink with the ha halophytic soils there. Uh, some of you from San Diego might be uh, familiar with the, uh, there's some settling ponds at Borrego Springs uh, with lots of mesquite and salt bush. That reminds me of Robin's Butte. Um, and then along the Gila River here. Um, meanwhile, this is the sagebrush map, and you can see that they're all over the desert. Um, one thing that is striking to me is, and I talk about this in the paper, is that they're, given all the habitat, you'd think they would be more numerous in the Western Mojave. Um, you know, through some concerted effort, uh, you know, Kimball and, and all you guys found a few out there. And it sounds like that Saddle, Saddlebrook Butte State Park, I think it's called. That sounds like a pretty promising site for sagebrush sparrows, and it looks like good habitat from those photographs. But in general, it, it's striking to me that there's sort of this big gap in sagebrush records right where you have bell sparrows. That's where their breeding distribution really is. And so, you know, that, I, again, I would love to do sampling out there uh, to tease that pattern apart more. And I hope that somebody listening to this does that if I don't find the time. Um, let's see. This is from iNaturalist. And again, you're seeing a similar pattern. This is sagebrush, sparrow. And again, these are all mapped uh, photographs. And so they're records that I find are more reliable than just um, undocumented reports. Um, and then here again, here's Bell Sparrow. So again, focus on that Western Mojave over here. Only one record in iNaturalist of uh, Sagebrush Sparrow and then lots of Bell Sparrows. But then for Bell Sparrow, uh, you only really find the photographed records along the Colorado and along the Gila River here. Some of these around here, if, if you bird around Phoenix, there's an area that is well known called the Thrasher Spot, where you can see Lacan's Thrashers and Ben Dyer's Thrashers and Crystal Thrashers and Sage Thrashers and Mockingbirds all in the same place. That's There's a lot of uh, atroplex there. And so that's an interesting <laughs> site that reminds me a bit of Saddlebrook in that you can more regularly find both species at that location. I think because it's both a little bit xeric 
and dry, yet it also has a significant amount of salt bush. Um, so for identification, um, again, I, I, you know, I, I was just going to copy one of Peter Pyle's images because they're so useful, but then I was like, well, just copy the whole slide because we got to get that link in there. People need to read that. So again, I, I strongly suggest that you check out Peter's work. Again, sage rush sparrows are here on the top and you can see all the streaks in the back. Bell sparrows are here on the bottom and, um, they're mostly, where there are streaks, they're much lighter brown, and they're much more diffuse. Um, I also checked in with John Dunn. I think it's it's kind of amazing and cool that, um, you know, this is one of the most vexing identification problems for North American birds, or at least in, in the United States. And one of our, you know, foremost experts at identifying birds lives in the contact zone in Bishop. And so he spends a lot of time looking at them. And this is from John. Uh, so he says, sagebrush. I look at two main things, the thin mailer streak along the sides of the throat, really almost the chin. I have a feeling it can be a little broader below and more to the sides of the throat. But then it goes very thin and extends upward towards the bill. That mailer stripe is blacker and broader at the bottom on a bells. So when viewed front on, it looks different. Then the back is finely but streaked with black across the back on sagebrush, as Kimball mentioned. While on bells, the streaks on the back are indistinct and thin and more blurry. This is enhanced because the color of the back is paler, sandier on sagebrush. And this color, when fresh, extends over to the sides and flanks. Um, both species have black streaked scapulars. And so this, let's see if I can find a, I have one here with, yeah. So I think these are two really great images of um, a bell sparrow on the left from Bridget Spencer and a, um, or I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, a bell sparrow on the left and a sagebrush on the right from Liam H Hutchinson. Um, you can see here um, the darker mailer here um, and the lack of back streaking here on the sagebrush. Um, it's a, it's, it's a sort of a broken mailer streak. It's, it's the, the gray is the same color as the face. Um, and you can see the back streaking here. And, and so I often see comments about the overall kind of cast to the plumage on the bird and the head and the contrast between the head and the and the back. I generally find that sage brushes in are, are, are have a more pale appearance um in the in the back and the sides uh, than bells. Um but I, 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 that's not, it's not as diagnostic to me. For me, at, you know, as we've mentioned tonight, I look at the back a lot. Here's a bell sparrow back. You can see the lack of streaks. Here's a sagebrush sparrow. You can see more streaks and they go all the way through the back. They can be much more darkly streaked than this one. This one has long streaks, which is helpful. Bell sparrows can have some streaks, but I often find that bell sparrows are not quite as long and not as strong through the back, um, but again, they go all the way through the back. And here on this image, or these two images, this is a sagebrush on the left and a bells on the right. And so you know, focusing on the, the malar streaks, you can see the sagebrush, they're very weak and they're not darker than the face. This is, these are images from my camera. So one thing, when I look at images, um, of the two species. Um, lighting is important because it affects how I can see the colors of gray. Um, it's often desert lighting, so the lighting's harsh. Often the pictures are washed out. Um, conversely, um, on, on, on camera settings, I use Canon, so I don't know, I'm not an expert on, can, on cameras, but for my Canons, there's a setting called contrast. And if you turn it up, it, there's more con it, it sort of dials up the contrast between the light colors and the dark colors. And on this camera, I, I, you know, the, I, for, I, I believe that the contrast settings are kind of, are, they're, they're, it's harsh. You can see even on the sagebrush sparrow, even the face looks dark. What's important is that the, the malar streak is not darker than the face. Um, on this bell sparrow down here, you can see how the malar streak is a much darker gray, almost black, than, than the face, which is sort of a, 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 a more flat gray. 
And so when I, the first thing, if I can't, if, if I'm looking at Mailer streaks, the, the very first thing, the most important thing to me is the color of that Mailer streak and it, it, in comparison to the face. Um, you know, you, you'll often hear that um, the Mailer streaks on bells are, 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 are wider, broader than on a sagebrush. And I think that that's more or less true. And you can see it here. Um, but 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 I find that you can have thin malar streaks on a bells. Um, it depends again on the time of the year. I think earlier on in the fall, there's a lot more white feathering in the throats that gets worn out. I think the malar streaks. I think Peter talks about this. The malar streaks become even more vibrant later on uh, into the spring as the feathers wear. When we were measuring the birds we measured the gap between the male eye streak and the bill here. We originally tried to, to measure the widths of the streaks, but we found that it was difficult that the streaks, um, it seemed to be kind of variable. Um, even on the same bird, the two streaks seemed to be quite different at times, kind of depending on how the feathers, the white feathers were laying. Um, and, and so I just, that the idea that bells have a, a thicker male eye streak, I think that's kind of both true, but it does, it's not diagnostic for me. For me, I'm really looking at the color of the streak. That's what I focus on more than maybe anything else. And if I can't tell if the lighting of the of the, of the photograph is such that I can't see the difference between the face and the streak, um, then I'll leave it as a slash. And um, I think that the most important thing for these species and telling them apart is that, you know, it's, it's very hard. Um, I probably, I have never tried to like graph myself, figure out, like, like take dead on myself, but I think I'd probably call more birds, leave them as a slash between bells and sage, but <clears throat> just look at the photographs than, than, than I trying to call one species or the other. I think that often the lighting um, or the angle on the bird uh, or just the birds, the birds are variable and some they're kind of intermediate. Uh, I often can't tell the difference. Um, and so it's to be conservative. I would suggest just always being conservative, uh, get multiple photographs of the bird. Uh, I often see a photograph. I'm like, oh, that metal streak looks pretty dark, but I, it's, I'd love to see the back. Cause I'm not sure if that's just the effect of the lighting of your photograph. And so it's, I, for me, when I'm out there in the field, trying to identify them, um, every once in a while, I'll have a checklist where I'll, I'll see, you know, six or seven sagebrush. They're all sagebrush. I've seen them over and over. They're just hanging out around me. I have unlimited time watching them, and I can see they're all sagebrushes um, or all bells, conversely. But most of the time, you know, it, it's hard to see them. You have to look at them for often a little bit of time to see all the parts of the bird you want to see. Uh, and, and then they, 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 they fly away, they move on you. And so um, I frequently, I, one of my checklists will say, you know, two sagebrushes and nine slashed sagebrush slash bells. Um, and, and so when I see a checklist from somebody that just says, you know, I saw 13 bell sparrows and no slashes, I suspect that list. I, 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 to me, I'm like, that's really rare that you'd have that clear of an idea of all of your birds. Um, you know, in my talk tonight, I talk about how they, we found them to be segregating in these different habitats and that most, for most of the sites, we only caught bells and we only caught sagebrushes. I, what I don't want is for people to, you know, submit an eBird checklist that only has one species and just says, yeah, these are all bell sparrows because I saw Chris's talk and he says that they segregate. Um, you know, I think that we did have sites where we found both of them. Um, I think that, you know, from your work in Los Angeles County, you're finding sites uh, where it is possible to find both of the species at times. You know, I often dream that I could have transmitters and all of those birds and all those bells and sagebrushes to see if they're doing different things. Cause I suspect they do, even though you happen to see them together cause there was water nearby or something. Um, and so um, again, I, I, I just stress to be conservative, conservative on your lists. 
call them all slashes until you can be sure that you, know, you really have seen all the looks at one that you need. Um, document them all with photographs. Um, there is one, I almost forgot about this. Um, Van, who was mentioned earlier today, he was out at um, that site and some correct, I believe it's, I think it's Saddleback Butte State Park. And so these are all from, these are Van and uh, Mark Wilson's photographs. And so I wanted to go through these with everybody. Um, you know, I just saw them for the first time a couple hours ago. So we can, I can point out why I think they're this species or that species. And so um, the way he's done this is great. Uh, he has each one cleanly labeled for me um, with times. Um, you know, frequently when you're observing these things in the field and trying to photograph them, there are multiple birds moving all over the place and you're lucky if you get a photograph off on one of them and then it moves. And so you start to lose track of which one was which, or if you have multiple photographs of the same bird or not. Um, and so I, I really appreciate the way that Van and Mark have done this, where they've you know listed the the individual birds and what time they observed them to give me a sense of you know how many were out there and which ones are different or the same. And so on this top photograph here, uh, I believe this is a sagebrush sparrow. You can't see the back very well. Um, the lighting on this photograph is helpful. It's not too bright. Um, it gives me a sense of the malar streak. The malar streak here is a really light gray. It's, you know, lighter or at least the same as the face, not darker than the face. So even though I can't see the back on this one, I'm comfortable with thinking this is a sagebrush because the malar streak is so light. Uh, this one bird B, uh, you can see here um, the strong back streaking. When I see birds in this light, I automatically start to worry because often birds in sort of like this sort of uh, dark blue light are really hard to tell apart because you can't see the colors of the gray very well. But on this bird, you can see that the back streaks go all the way through the back. They're long and dark streaks. So again, I'm okay with the sagebrush sparrow on this one. Um, this is the same bird with more of an angle to it. And again, uh, you can see the back streaks of the, the center of the back. Um, his next one, bird C, uh, um, this one was an interesting one. He has this blown up version first, and then there's another one of the bird here. Uh, it gives me this one. If I only had this one photograph, I would be unsure what to call this because you can see in that malar streak, there's a bit of dark in it. And so sagebrushes can show occasionally a bit of dark in the streak if you're really careful. Um, with a bird at this distance, just at this angle, if I only had this one photograph, I, I don't think I would I would leave this as a slash. But then he immediately got one of the other side of the bird's face. Um, and you can see this gray. Uh, it's I'm more comfortable with it as a sagebrush. It's the same color as the face. Um, and then he zoomed in on it here. And again, the gray is it's it, to me, it's the same color as the face. It, it does have that sort of warm flank that John Dunn was talking about. Now that he wrote me that I'm going to be looking at that all the time. Uh, I think this is probably a sagebrush also. Um, this one here. Um, so this is a bad angle of the bird is in the shade. Um, the, the, the streak, the male streak looks like it might be not all that dark, but you can't really see it. Uh, it there's an oblique angle on the back that, that again, looks like there might be some streaks, but it's, you really can't see the, the back very well. And to me, it's, it's you know, within that uh, intermediate zone between bells and sagebrush where if I can't even see the back and has streaks like this, I'm not really certain about the identity of this bird at all. Uh, here's another one of the bird. Um, you know, I don't see much for back streaks there. The malar streak looks dark compared to the face here, but it's it's kind of washed out because there's a plant in front of the bird, so it's out of focus. Um, and then there's a third photograph here. And again, the malar streak looks dark to me. Can't really see the back at all. Um, and so I, I, you know, I wonder if this is a bells, but none of these are really good angles or in focus. And so I would leave this one as a slash. Um, Bird E here, even though the bird's kind of obscured and distant, you can see the back really well with these long dark streaks to the back. So it looks okay to, for a sagebrush to me. 
Um, here's another one. I I find this angle of the back. It's again it's suggestive. There's long streaks. It's not a very good angle for me. This this one is better. Um, it's more of a straight on shot of the back. You can see the center of the back much better. Uh, I think it's a sagebrush. Um, bird F. This is similar to that earlier one. I think it was bird B. You can see bad light, but there's streaks to the back. Um, Again, not the best light, but pretty good streaks in the back. The male eye streak, it's in bad light, but nothing about this looks bells to me. That seems like it's a sagebrush to me. Um, this one has really good streaks to the back. I'm okay with the sagebrush on this one, bird G. Um, it's probably the same bird. And then bird H, this is an easy one. This is a sagebrush also. It's really dark uh, streaks in the back. Um, and this is, I like this photograph a lot because it shows the streaks in the back, but it also shows the Maillard streak. So when I look at this photograph and I'm trying to evaluate it, you know, I wonder, uh, like, oh, did this person turn up the contrast on the photograph or was it just sent that, was the camera just set up that way, um, such that it makes this look really, really dark? You know, I, I wonder about that, but then on this shot, you can see that, yeah, the streaks are dark, but nonetheless, you know, this male eye streak isn't very dark at all here. It's the same color as the face. It's a lighter gray. Um, and so I think this is fine for sagebrush. Um, and this one, this is the same bird. If I had this bird as a standalone, I would think it was probably a sagebrush. There, there's a little bit of dark flecking in the in the in the male eye streak, but there's some light also. But I would leave it as a slash. I can't tell from this one photograph alone. Um, oh yeah, then there's this one flying. This one, you can't really tell what it is. Um, this one, this too oblique. It's, I su suspect this is sagebrush, but you can't really tell. Uh, this is an easy sagebrush with those back streaks. And here's a really nice photograph showing both the male streak that's light and not all the way to the beak and the, the back streaks. Uh, here's a nice profile of the male eye streak. Um, and then these are really nice photographs. I don't know, Mark and Van, if you can hear this, but you, these are good photographs. The lighting on these is really helpful for identifying. If, if you are good at photography and you know how to um, control your lighting so that you're getting photographs like this uh, that allow people to see the differences in the different colors of gray, that's really helpful. Um, and here's an easy sagebrush with that Maillard streak. One thing that I would say is that on this checklist, I, I noticed that, um, you know, he had these, he, I think it was something like 15 birds that were slashed that were waiting for someone to look at them. And, the, and then he had maybe 15 bell sparrows. And forgive me guys if I'm wrong, but I think that's what it said. But the bell sparrows didn't have a photograph. And I would encourage everyone, you know, when you get these sites with both species, like that's a red flag. I don't, it's not impossible at all, but I would really try to document that with photographs of both of the species, not just one of them. And I think that could be an artifact of eBird. You know, if one of them is flagged on the filter as rare and one isn't, then you might not try as hard to document the one that's not flagged. Um, but in a case like this, you know, with it, what sounds like pretty good numbers of perhaps both species, that's super interesting. Um, and so I would encourage everybody to um, work on getting those photographs uh, of all of the species, not just the rare one. So I guess that kind of wraps it up. Uh, hopefully I was not on mute the entire time and you actually heard this. Uh, and let me know if you have any questions. Now that is funny. We sh you should have helped us out at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Chris, thank you very much. That was, oh, I have something weird happening with my. Oh, you're just in space. <laughs> I'm very spacey. <laughs> my very wife spacey. often says that. No, thank you very much, Chris. And and um, anybody who has questions, please put them in the Q&A. Um, okay. And we can read questions that people have. And, and again, you know, if I had a lot more time, I. 
in my talk, I, I we have um, in the article that's it's 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 free access on JFO, the Journal of Field Ornithology, and we also there's a dryad link, so you can download all of our photographs of all of the things I was showing you. It's 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 a huge file, but you can download them and check them out at your leisure. And um, and so I, you know, if I had more time, I would love to, you know show you a spectrum of like 40 bell sparrows from the very darkest ones to the very lightest ones and i mm -hmm. never had time to just do that it's, but yeah. you know it's available if you want to do that those sort of graphs you can download them well speaking of that i went to birdnet.org and i couldn't figure out how to actually get in to look at species and things like that while i was trying to listen to you as well did you birdnet what is what is birdnet.org? I'm already Did, spacing out. Uh, that's the site you gave us with the um, with the museum species available. Oh, it's that link isn't Bird working Net. anymore. That's a new. I didn't know that. Um, no, well, apparently it didn't work, and I couldn't uh, try it but, from the article. For, try it from the JFO article in case I copied and pasted it in completely or something. And then if this still doesn't work, then let me know and I'll I'll track it down for you. Okay. Because it, it JFO wouldn't is not it. Go ahead, Kimball. Birdnet's not terribly easy to use. I mean, you kind of have to figure out what keywords to enter and all that. But if you can get into Birdnet, um, use the scientific names and you should be able to search for the specimens um, by collection or by all collections. But you do kind of have to figure out how to how and where to put in the keywords and all that. Okay. Um, one quick thing I would mention, I don't know if this would come up in Q&A, is sagebrush sparrows being highly migratory, at least if you look at the difference between the northernmost part of the breeding range and how far they can go in winter. Um, like most highly migratory birds have a lot of scatter. So it's interesting that, for example, in the LA County Museum, we have a specimen of sagebrush sparrow from San Clemente Island. And what I take from that is if you were to get a sage sparrow right on the coast, uh, where they're obviously extremely rare, it's probably more likely going to be a sagebrush sparrow than a canescent bell sparrow. Now, of course, the nominate bells can breed near the coast, but if you get a pale bird, uh, it really would most likely be a um, sage brush sparrow. However, also keep in mind that bell sparrows disperse um, in big numbers upslope after the breeding season. So by May or June, you can get bell sparrows at 8,000 feet in the San Gabriel Mountains, and there's a lot of them spill over to the coastal slope. Hmm. Um, I'd still be surprised to get one on the immediate coast, but they have that really interesting upslope movement. So lot to be learned but just be aware of all these movements yeah and, and what so one of i, I kind of sidetracked myself when i was talking about habitat and that is, an important thing is that we found these really nice patterns outside of the bell sparrow breeding distribution in western arizona where we were mostly catching female bell sparrows when i look at bell sparrow photographs um in ebird or an iNaturalist from with, within the breeding distribution a lot of those locations look a lot more like the places we'd find sagebrush sparrows in our study. And so, and, and bell sparrows breed out there. And so I believe, again, and I encourage, you know, if, if I can ever get to it, someone to do this, I think that our nice habitat pattern, I don't think that'll hold up in the breeding distribution. I think that um, because bell sparrows are, are nesting there, like, like, for example, I work on Inyo California Toys in the Argus range and there's lots and lots of bell sparrows nesting up in those mountains and some of those canyons you know that's very similar to where we were catching sagebrush sparrows at Boundary Cone and so I, I I just it's another reason for me to hope that we can get some sampling inside of the breeding distribution wintering birds but inside the breeding distribution to to you know it, I would love nothing more than for somebody to, to poke a hole in the pattern we found and then have a mechanism that explains why that is. And so I hope that somebody does that. Yeah. Sounds good. Let's get, we have a bunch of questions, Mark. Yes. Let's get to the, the question. So, um, um, Van, well, Van's not really a question. He said, thank you. And we'll add photos of the obvious bells to the list too. 
great. Uh, awesome. Thank you. Okay. Um, Alexander says, thank you for the talk. Do you know any behavioral study work done with regard to sagebrush and bell sparrows? With it, I, I assume he means with them interacting with each other. Um, or, or maybe difference in behavior. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, I just worked on the, uh, we're, we're working the, for the birds of the world account for Bell Sparrow. We did a revision of it and I was helping with that. And, um, most of the behavioral work was done when they were considered to be just sage sparrows. And it was mostly done farther North, I think within the sagebrush sparrow breeding distribution. So for me, you know, especially I, I always, I, I can't remember where I read it. I think I've heard that there's even, I think it's in one of Carla Cicero's papers. There, there, there might be some question where, whether or not connescence is even separate from nominate bells. And, and if connescence would, you know, what if that was an, its own species one day? It, it, it's a, to me, it's a super fascinating taxon. It's breeding distribution, the geography of it, it's just in this small area, it extends all the way over to the Carrizo Plain. Um, and then they winter in Arizona. It's just it's such an unusual map. Um, and, and because of the recent split, like, you know, for our wintering study, no one knew which one was which and where they were in the winter. And, and the same goes for behavior. Like, I don't think many people have worked on bell sparrow behavior because they were just thought to be sage sparrows and somebody did that work in Idaho. So. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you um someone asked how do you draw blood for dna analysis maybe i missed it but what are the genetic differences found well uh, you you so this is my weak spot uh i don't know much about genetics um you take it from the brachial vein so you open the wing and you can see a, there's a large vein called the brachial vein and that's where you take the sample from and that was michael's specialty michael had worked i think on a seaside sparrow project the previous year so he was very good at bleeding sparrows um, and so you take, you, you have a small needle, you prick the brachial vein, you get a bead of blood and you put it on, you have a piece of filter paper, hold the filter paper to the, to the wing, to the blood and it, and it soaks into the filter paper, put it in an envelope and that's that. And then as far as Adrian Kovacs analysis, I don't know much about that. I'm not a genetics guy. Um, so I can't tell you much more about that. I, I, she wrote that part of the paper and she talked about it a bit. And then in turn, she was uh, mirroring what Carla Cicero did in her paper. So you can read up more on those protocols in that chain of papers, but I would mess it up if I tried to explain it to you. Okay, thank you. Um, Rebecca asks, when do bells and satyr sparrows leave the Southern deserts? Oh, this is, yeah, uh, I think, how does it go? And Kim will correct me on this. I think I'm gonna get it wrong. I think bell sparrows leave, uh, I wanna say bell sparrows leave first, but I think sagebrushes might start to move first. I can't remember. Um, I Off the top of my head, again, I don't wanna guess and I can't remember off the top of my head. Kim, well, do you remember? No, I really don't know from my experience around here. Partly the problem, of course, is bells are a common resident, so it's hard to know if birds come in for the winter and then leave. And sagebrush, you know, we're we're lucky we're just documenting they're even there in midwinter, let alone finding out how long they stay in spring. But I would guess that I wouldn't expect to find them after March, but I don't know. Just a guess right now. Yeah. So in other words, a stay tuned answer. Stay yeah, it's something you can, you, it's, it's, if you subscribe to the Cornell Birds of the World, it's easily, you can find it's, it's in there. I just oh. can't remember off the top of my head. Yeah. So Pete asks, uh, looked like part of the coastal bells population entirely vacated their breeding range while coastal bells to the north and to the south were resident. Um, is that an artifact of not enough observations? Let's see. I could I could go back into the slideshow and show that map, but at the same time, I don't know the answer to that. I know very little about coastal bells. So I th always thought they were pretty sedentary, uh, but I don't know much about their movements off the top of my head. Okay. 
Uh, yeah, I think they're quite sedentary, so it's probably an artifact of who's birding in their range at different times of year and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, question by Van. You mentioned the songs of the two species can be diagnostic. Are you aware of any of the calls or other vocalizations can be diagnostic as well? No, I've done I I I've done no work on the acoustics. Um, it's not my strong suit, and it's not. I don't have time to do that. Um, I believe that I have begun to pick up. I can hear a bell sparrow song, Canessa song, and I think I can tell most of the time that song from a sagebrush is also not my strong suit to describe that in words not very good at that um and, and so as far as the other calls go no i'm not aware of anyone finding something i don't know if anyone's really looked um i would very unscientific when we were trying to catch the birds we had to scout them and so we like several. i i never use i hate playback several of you know about that know that about me um but for this project we were using playbacks we had to find them with i had volunteers we had to find them quickly and we found that the birds more readily responded to in sibley the bells uh, vocalization than sagebrush even sagebrush is more readily responded to bells than sagebrush that's we weren't taking data but that's we, we we always use the bells track because that worked better hmm. huh. Interesting. um i think that was from part of that was from earlier yeah. pro question uh carol asks i missed where to go to look at bell sparrow pictures uh could you please repeat oh. i find it very <laughs> hard to determine when I, when i am birding in the antelope valley yeah. Um, so to review Bell Sparrow pictures, if you go to eBird and um, there's a on the top, there's Explore data. It's one of the drop down menus and you open that and then that, that from there you can get to uh, Explore uh, Photos and Sounds, I think it's called. Uh, so you can go to that and then you can set the filter for, you know, Bell Sparrow and even the, you can set it for Bell Sparrow Canescence. And then on the right of the screen, there's another filter that you can only, it, it says, you know, you can turn it on looking at the most recent photograph or the earliest photograph or the most recently uploaded or the highest quality because they people vote on them with stars in eBird. So if you set it on the highest quality, you're now looking at the very best Canessens Bell Sparrow photographs in the Macaulay collection. And so that is a good way to do it. Um, one thing is when you use that reference, you have to be aware that occasionally things are not identified correctly. Um, if they're not flagged as rare, um, then no one might notice for quite some time that you've misidentified your bird. Um, so take it with a grain of salt, but that's, for me, that's one of you know the most useful references. Even talking to Peter Pyle, he uses it all the time because he can find photographs of birds throughout the year. So you can see he's getting like ideas of like molt patterns just from looking at Macaulay photographs. So it's very useful. Um, from, for, for the work that I did, um, there was, uh, it's been posted in the chat. There's a link to the article in the Journal of Field Ornithology. And then in that paper, there is a link to our actual photographs. You can download them. Uh, of all the birds in the hand. It's a very big file. It's like several gigabytes, but you can download it. It's free and you can look at pictures that way also. Mm -hmm. Great. Very cool. Thank you. Um, oh, Lily has a question. I'm going to make my hair. <laughs> can, can they hybridize? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it's what, it's, barrels are hard. It's, sometimes it's hard to prove it. Um, if you look at the uh, the Cicero and and uh, coup papers, they did find birds with that, that had. Um, that, uh, I'm going to mess up the terminology. I'm not. This is my strong suit. Um, it, it seemed like there were birds that might be mixing. We had a bird in our sample. So so of those, we had six birds where our field identification didn't match the haplotype and as i was talking about it's there's 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 floating haplotypes it doesn't always mean that you you've misidentified it but we did have one bird i think it was um 
a bird that we, let's see how it is. It, it was a bird that we thought, I think was a, we thought it was a bells. The haplotype was sagebrush, but the bird was fairly intermediate. And we wondered if that one could be a hybrid with our method of testing the genetics. It wasn't that sophisticated a method to figure that out. Um, and I, I think as far as I know, Dr. Kovac still might even have all of those blood samples. I don't know if we collected enough blood to figure that out. You, you have to like, you'd want to be looking at the whole genome. And we just, you know, when I worked on the Inyo California Toys, uh, we did a whole, I did a whole genomic study with Purdue University and we collected much more blood for that. You, you need more blood to run that kind of analysis. So I don't know if our samples were strong enough for that. And I don't know if Carla, it's been a while since I read her papers now that I wrote this about a year ago. I I want to say that she had some birds that seemed intermediate. I can't recall what she said about those birds exactly. Oh, that's interesting. Sounds like a, another stay tuned. Yeah. yeah. Um... But again, remember that that contact zone you know, we're talking about 15 to 25 kilometers. That's what's the, that's 10 to what 20 miles of, of contact with yeah. Bishop in the with Bishop in the middle of it. So so if you find the hybrids, they'd probably be around Bishop. Well, yeah, maybe. But, 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 but yeah. But I think most of the time, um, you know, that's Mono, I review Mono County for eBird, and the very southern end of Mono County comes down that Sherwood grade. So I get some Bell Sparrow reports in the very southern end of the county. And, um, you know, occasionally Debbie House and uh, some other birders will add photographs, and they always seem to be Bells. If they're hybrids, I can't tell. They look like Bells to me. I don't know if anybody would be able to tell in the field. You'd have to sort of catch them and take blood. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay, Max has a question. Uh, considering birds at Saddleback Butte, the habit out there is predominantly creosote, space five to ten feet apart, with about three to four foot tall bushes that were generally four by four feet wide and long. I couldn't help but notice when birding up there, uh, finding sagebrush sparrows, they'd only stay in creosote compared to the bell sparrows who are happy to flit around in saltbush and Joshua trees. Even when sagebrush were consistently following bell sparrows and brewer sparrows, they would never leave creosote except when running on the ground or flying. Have you noticed this at all, or have you have you found anything related to sagebrush sparrows specifically to creosote? Um, not specific to creosote. Um, I don't know. You know, I like to try to figure out the mechanism behind the pattern I see, and I don't know what the different species that are eating, you know, why those habitat differences exist. I, I think that for bell sparrows, it's been shown on the Colorado River that, you know, they, they moved into sueda habitats later in the winter, um, presumably that, you know, as, as insects decrease over the winter, they're focusing more on seeds. And they're finding what they want in the sueda and in the atroplex in those habitats. So in the same vein, sagebrushes, um, you know, but I don't, I've never done any kind of stomach work on them. I don't know what they're foraging on. Um, I have seen that pattern when I mentioned uh, southwest of Phoenix, that thrasher spot, you can find it. You're, now you're getting on the very edge of the bell sparrow distribution sage sparrows it's kind of like the, the flip of that saddlebag you situation in arizona it's like mostly sage brushes with some bells and i i i have noticed that there's some little washes that go through that site with the with the salt bush on the edges of the washes and that's where you see the bells whereas the sage brush is just kind of like out in the flats um but so I, i've noticed that i don't have any data on that it's just something i noticed when i was out there all right. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I think we're out of questions. There are no more questions in the Q&A. Uh, okay, hey, well, yeah. Go ahead. And there were there was a ton of comments in the chat. Thank you for a wonderful presentation, Chris. And thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. I agree. 
Uh, I think everyone got a lot out of this. And Kimball, mm -hmm. thank you very much for your bits mm -hmm. of wisdom. Sage and, advice. And sage advice. <laughs> it will definitely. Well, it thank definitely... you, Chris. You're welcome. It was good to be here. Uh, I, yes, I, I look forward to having you here, and we can uh, uh, think about a, a follow up at some point. Yeah, and thanks for answering all the questions too. You're, you're yeah. great. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. My my email is there in the chat. If you guys ever want me to look at photographs, I'm happy to do that. Um, and and I hope you know. I don't know, Kimball, what you're doing, but I I've always kind of crossed my fingers that you you might lead some sort of misnetting effort out there. You might be able to convince somebody to analyze your blood for you um and and catch some birds up in the west mojave because i th i you know this looks like there's a lot of people here that are interested in that and um like i said we did it with just a couple thousand dollars in arizona so maybe it's possible yeah i think we could probably interest uh, some folks in local museum collections to get involved with that and i'd be happy to help so um stay tuned yeah i'll too and, and that I also noticed when I was looking at the Vernet stuff that there are not very many win winter samples from the West Mojave. Most of the samples were from outside of the breeding distribution for bells. Mm -hmm. So there's just not a lot of data uh, from the winter in that part of California. A lot of work to be done. Great. Okay. Uh, well, thank you again for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Um, Please join us in a couple of weeks when Van presents um, on his California birding adventure. And uh, I think that's it, Mark. Yes, I think that's it. Great. Thank Good you. Good night, everyone. Thanks, Thank everybody. you all very much. We This is recorded and will be up on our website soon. And thanks again, Chris. Take care, everyone. See you. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.